Hi, welcome to this week's video. We are moving on a few chapters in Acts this time to uh, Acts chapter 8 and verses 26 to 40. By this time, Stephen has been martyred and persecution has started against the church and a lot of them have scattered. And we're going to read about uh, one of the deacons in the church, Philip, and and an incident with him. Acts 8, then, verses 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a, la a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns, until he reached Caesarea. If my wife tries to speak to me about something while I'm watching the television, there's more than a fair chance that I won't take it in uh, what she's saying. She'll have to tell me to stop listening to the TV in order to listen to her. After all, as a man, I can only ever do one thing at a time. And I certainly can't listen to more than one source of sound simultaneously. It makes me think of something I was told in a training session for people who were going to engage in prayer ministry. The instructor said that we had two ears and that we had to listen to the person in need with one ear and to the Holy Spirit with our other ear. Well, that sounded tricky. It was better when they advised a team of two people to pray with whoever came forward, with one team member listening to the person and the other listening to the spirit but part of our task as the church is to engage in multiple listening the late john stott called it double listening where we listen to the bible and to the world not that we are to squeeze the bible into today's standards and values which happens far too often uh, but that we find where the gospel speaks to today's world and in our strange and wonderful Bible reading today, Philip engages in multiple listening. And it's this multiple listening that enables him to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to faith in Christ. Three um, elements of Philip's listening for us. Firstly, Philip listens to the Holy Spirit. 
So the reading begins with an angel who's speaking on God's behalf, directing Philip to go to the desert road. And when he's there, the spirit tells him to go near the eunuch's chariot and stay near it. Well, it's easy to say, listen to the Holy Spirit, isn't it? But harder to get to grips with it for ourselves. At one end of the Christian spectrum, we have people who say they have never known God to speak to them, along with others who say that God only speaks to us now through the Bible. At the other end, there are Christians who, in the words of one preacher, claim to have had more words from the Lord before breakfast than Billy Graham had in a lifetime. Some of these people are harmless fruitcakes, but others are manipulative and abusive leaders. I once heard a story about a man who went to his vicar and said, Wonderful news, vicar. You know that gorgeous blonde woman in the choir? The Lord has told me to marry her. No, he hasn't, replied the vicar. Yes, he has. No, he hasn't. Yes, he has. No, he hasn't, insisted the vicar. You're already married. I think there's a healthy middle path to be found here. I do believe God still speaks to us, but I also believe that as with the man who wanted to marry the blonde, we test that against what he's revealed to us in the Bible. And I would say that some of us who think God hasn't spoken to us are mistaken. He has told us things, but perhaps we haven't always recognised it was him. Take the, the common example of feeling prompted to phone a friend or a relative only to do so and discover that they're ill or in some other predicament. We can then pray for that person or help meet their needs. Isn't that something the Holy Spirit would do? An Anglican priest friend of mine used to lead an organisation in London called the Christian Healing Mission. In teaching Christians about prayer, John would invite people to sit quietly and ask God to speak to them, and then keep silence. He would encourage them to write down whatever impressions came into their mind, believing that God did indeed want to speak to his children. He never denied the need to be discerning about what people thought they heard, but he believed we should be optimistic about God's desire to speak to us. So why don't we open ourselves all the more to the possibility of the Holy Spirit speaking to us? What adventures might he take us on for the sake of God's kingdom advancing like he did with Philip? So firstly, Philip listens to the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Philip listens to the eunuch. Here I'm thinking of where Philip enters into a conversation with the eunuch about what he is reading and what it means. When I was a child, we had a family GP who seemed to start writing you a prescription before you'd finished telling him what was wrong with you. He didn't really listen to your problems. And we have seen something similar in the current general election campaign. How many of our leaders, when a member of the public asks them a question, be it in a TV debate or on a radio phone-in, just launch into their prepared answer on that subject without listening to the nuances of that person's personal concerns? It happens in the religious sphere too, when well-meaning evangelists splurge out the gospel without listening to the people they are trying to reach. And while they have a point that the gospel is unchanging, we need to find the point of contact or even perhaps the point of conflict so that we can make the gospel connect with folk. So Philip takes the trouble to listen to the man's concerns. On his way back from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, um, a journey that would have ta <clears throat> taken a couple of months by chariot, that this man is serious in his inquiring after God. He seems to think there is something in the Jewish faith he's been worshipping in Jerusalem, and he's reading the Hebrew scriptures. 
but as a eunuch he will not be allowed to convert fully to Judaism. I think there's a desire for God and for belonging here, and Philip picks up on it. Philip knows this man's deepest longings can be satisfied in Jesus. W. E. Sangster, the famous minister at Westminster Central Hall in the Second World War, said that the gospel is like a diamond with many facets. We need to discover, he said, which facet shines on a particular person or situation in order to make the gospel excuse me, uh, connect with them. And the moment we understand that, we see the need to listen to people, not just regurgitate a pre-packaged version of the gospel that we have memorised. I mean, it is a good thing at times to learn summaries of the gospel and also to be able to recount our own testimony. But we must be careful first to listen to the people we are aiming to reach for Christ so that we may share the good news in the most appropriate way. So firstly, Philip listens to the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Philip listens to the eunuch. Thirdly and finally, Philip listens to the scripture. Now, I, I think that the fact that the eunuch is reading this powerful passage from Isaiah 53 that we often call the suffering servant means that the Holy Spirit is already at work in his life, preparing him for the gospel and pointing him to where he needs to ask questions. Perhaps he realises that attempts to explain this passage in terms of it merely being about the prophet himself can only go so far and ultimately um, doomed to fail. There are parts of it that just don't fit. You know, he asks Philip, who's the prophet speaking about, himself or someone else? And along comes Philip for this meeting orchestrated by the Spirit. He listens to the Bible passage the eunuch is reading and he responds. But notice how he responds. In verse 35 we read, Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Philip does what the early church did. They listen to scripture and interpret it in the light of Jesus. The Hebrew scriptures had pointed to a coming Messiah. Now he had come in the person of Jesus. It made sense not just to read the holy writings to quote proof texts often out of context but to read and understand them in the light of Jesus so that's what Philip does here he listens to these verses from Isaiah and says that ultimately they only make sense in the light of the good news of Jesus and as a result, this man who could not fully belong in Judaism due to his castration can fully belong to Jesus. His baptism is surely a joyful expression of that truth. What Philip is doing is rather like Jesus on the Emmaus Road. As Jesus came alongside the two travellers, he opened the scriptures and related them to himself. Philip comes alongside the Ethiopian eunuch and relates the scriptures to Jesus. This approach grounds us in the centrality of the Bible as our authoritative account of the Christian faith, but it doesn't mean that we act as Bible bashers. We are not using isolated Bible texts as weapons to hurt people. There will always be the odd prejudiced person who accuses us of that, and we can't do anything about that. But our main task is to listen to the scriptures and share how they point to Jesus. The Holy Spirit uses this to make Jesus real to people and lead them to him. 
However, most of the people we encounter will not be reading Bible passages and asking us to make sense of them, although it might happen occasionally. We instead need to be people who are listening to the Bible ourselves anyway and are looking for how it points to Christ. As we feed ourselves in this way on Jesus, the bread of life, we shall be more fully equipped for the conversations we have with friends and family members and neighbours who don't share our faith. Our own willingness to engage in spiritual discipline with the Bible is not only good for us, it has benefits for our witness. So then, let's draw this all together. You know, when we consider mission, and especially evangelism like here, we give a lot of emphasis to speaking. And the speaking is, of course, necessary. But we need to appreciate the importance of listening, too. Because that's what Philip knew here. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit who guides us into divine appointments. We need to listen to those we are aiming to reach so that we may share our hope in Christ in a way that connects with them and challenges them. And we need to listen to Scripture, particularly to the way it points to Christ, because that is the truth we are seeking to share. So, thank you for listening. And I hope you might be back with me in a week's time when we'll go into Acts chapter 9 and have a look at the conversion of Saul and what that tells us about our mission. Until then, goodbye and God bless you. Bye-bye.